Hello, and welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. I'm Donya Williams. How are you guys doing today? Hope you guys are having a good Sunday, and we would like to welcome our special guest, Louis Clavel, who is a program specialist with the Library of Congress. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello. How are you today? I'm well, thank you. And for full disclosure, yes, another cousin is in the house this okay. time. <laughs> This time, Lewis is uh, my cousin, so again, welcome to the show. And would you like to just tell us a little bit about what, what, a, special, what a program specialist does for the Library of Congress? Thanks, cousin. Um, you know, that is such a warm introduction as family, and I think that I'm actually joining family here with yes. all the folks yes. here. Y'all know um, me, so. So first and foremost, I'd like to give thanks and praise to the Most High God, Amen. our Creator. Mother, Father, God, all that equilibrium that that invokes. Um, and whatever I am, it's because of all the great teachers that I've had and my family. Uh, I'm thankful for having a great mother and some of the great teachers that took time with me, um, like Ishaka Musa Barashango, Nana Kofu, Elder Amram, Elder Bongo, I'm giving thanks and praise to all of them to even share this knowledge with you. Um, and also all of uh, my great ancestors that even I'm learning about through a program like this, Genealogy Adventures, um, whereby these conversations empower all of us to uh, find more out about ourselves. This is one of the tricks of our history is that we supposedly don't know anything about ourselves to the point that we don't discover it, but I'm happy to say that George Washington Josie is my great, great grandfather. And I found that out through an experience through genealogy. He was 19 when he joined the 37th Colored Infantry and fought in the Civil War. His mother's name was Venus. She was a slave. I found all those things out by really checking the databases out. And maybe that's why I'm here, and that's why the Library of Congress is in any way significant to this. What I'm saying does not represent them. It does not represent their interest. It represents my ideas. I may work for them and do projects there that I, I feel are important. I'm happy to share with you. But I'm also not easily falling into a trick bag of, I said something under the guise of something else. I am me. <laughs> and well, I'm a program specialist to answer your question. <laughs> so, you know, all of that, it's two words, program and specialist. I work on programs yeah. specially. Well, before we get into that, you can't mention Mr. Jossie, our great-great-grandfather, -grand great -great without his most famous story. Do you know this man who not only fought for the, he left North Carolina, fought for the Union Army, and in one battle, all he had was a bayonet. That was it. To tell that story. He didn't have any bullets, just yeah. a bit. And you tell it better than I do. Well, it was a battle of Haymarket. And um, when you're studying these things, you can go through the military records that are held at the National Archives. And you can get to a document called the Compendium, Compendium of the Civil War, which okay. documents every battle. And in the Battle of Haymarket, the black troops did not have arms with live ammunition. They had bayonets, and our great-great-great-grandfather was mustered in in 1863 and was mustered out at the end of the Civil War, and he survived all of that. And went back home. And went back home. Wow. He did. So one of the ways that I got introduced to your work was you were part of the Rosa Parks exhibition. And I just wanted you to spend a little bit of time, because I think it's really fascinating. You know, you went to Detroit, was it? and had all of these crates that the general public, no one outside of her family had ever seen and hid this stuff. What was it like the first time you just lifted up that lid and you're looking at her personal, these are her personal effects? Yeah, that, that was an amazing moment. It's, it's a moment of discovery and connecting to things. So it was a time where I could really learn and experience what it's like to put my, 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 my consciousness forward in a way that objects could speak to me and tell me more about their historical significance. Um, I think that 
you know, being part of the collection management team and being part of the dispersal team of these 3D materials, uh, we entered into uh, a sanctuary of her personal things that she had collected all of her life, things that reflected her strength, things that were part of, quite frankly, her illnesses, different things that, you know, were she kept because she was a great archivist and she knew we would be reading through. Um, but at the same time, I felt uh, very responsible to her and her family, to those that loved her as part of the organization she left behind um, to do things honorably. Uh, it really put me in the mind of what we all can do for our families, and that's record and keep some significant things and have a preservation technique whereby some of the documents can be in proper folders and possibly things not stored under the leaky pipe in the basement. <laughs> but Mrs. Parks archived everything, all of her documents, her clothing from significant times in her life. Really? That was photographed, the, the clothing that she wore, and she I, the Congressional Medal, et cetera. She was tiny. I get the feel, just looking at that house coat that's part of the exhibition, I just get the feeling you could actually pick her up and put her put her in your pocket. She was tiny. Wait a minute. So she 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 took certain things like say the the articles that she wore on the bus when she sat down. She took those things, folded them up, and just put them away. Yes, uh, they were put away, and certain things have a huge historical value, like the coat that she wore in the photographs when she was being booked. Um, the hat that she wore in some of the photographs after the uh, bus boycott. So she just um, knew to do this? Well, she did. And, and even some documents from the 40s, which are really important because the importance of the exhibit is that we find out so much more about Mrs. Parks. She was the secretary of the NAACP at 29. She investigated sexual violence against women. And she has documents in the collection that talk about Recy Taylor and how people can support the action of the NAACP as it investigated times where black women were very vulnerable to white aggression and sexual assault. And these things were a great concern. And as I look at them, it's giving us a, a, a better position to have a conversation of how black women led America through such a difficult time in its history. And that's when, it, again, I would urge anyone who has the opportunity to go to the Library of Congress to see the exhibition. You can also see it online at the Library of Congress's website. But there's so much, there's just so much more to Rosa Parks' story than, than the bus boycott. I'm so sorry, my thing is getting <laughs> mute. It's on. So I was going to say, there's just so much more to her story than just the, the bus boycott. I didn't realize she was a huge advocate for young black women. You know, it's, I'm doing a lot of advocating, doing a lot of advocating for them. <laughs> sorry, just going to wait for um, the, mute, the mute to go on. Sometimes you got to say it twice. <laughs> this is crazy. Can you just put the lid? I'm just going to move this up. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so uh, there was the, the fact that she was an advocate for young black women. Um, the other thing was the, the genealogical background information. I never knew, I never realized that she was triracial. She was Native American, black, and European. She had a lot of, part of her family were, were free people of color. And this is all part of the exhibition. So for, for genealogists who are really interested in how you can incorporate genealogy into exhibitions, this is a perfect exhibition to actually do that. Yes. So there's profiles on her parents, on her grandparents, I think even her great, I think it even goes back to her great grandparents. So kind of starting in Georgia and just kind of working, working its way over. It's, it really is a fascinating exhibition. I, I just came away with it with, with so much new knowledge, just realizing, as I said, there was so much more to her than just that one day in Alabama. I'm, I'm, I'm like in awe right now because I did not know that she was an archivist. Well, I, I just did that, just something that I just, I just did not know that. So 
I mean, when you think about the different things that went on with her, the bus boycott, the being going through being booked and all of those different things and to know that okay well I'm being booked so okay I'm gonna have to take this hat I'm gonna have to set this to the side and I'm gonna have to take this dress and I'm gonna have to set this to the side because this is going to be important later on down the line understanding that we weren't thought of they didn't think of us a certain way back then they didn't you, you know what I'm saying? So why would I think that my coat was going to be important in history? And let's, well, that might have been her idea. It might have also been something that was suggested to her. As well, that's a fantastic way. part of it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think that what we learn about Mrs. Parks is that many of her actions were planned and deliberate. And the fact that she went to the Highland School um, in Tennessee in August before the bus boycott with other people that learned what to do in a protest, learned what to do when they were being arrested. It was more of a calculated event, and when you really study it, you can see that even who they chose for the court case and for the media presentation was something that possibly Edie Nixon, but even more strongly, some of the women in Alabama helped to cal calculate, and Joanne Robinson, who was a professor at Alabama State at the time, was a leader of a political group that, you know, really got the Montgomery boy bus boycott going. And when we see all the elements of this, it's possible the reason they aren't highlighted is because it's a blueprint of what we should be doing now. There should be an economic <laughs> position for us to have if we want to so-called boycott or protest. If we walk with a sign without not riding the bus, it doesn't make as much sense. So do we do that as a one event, my feet are hurting? No, you do it through training, you do it through creating cadres of respectability, you do it by, for, by get, getting behind the rights of our black women being called out of their names, working in domestic positions, riding the bus home late at night, being sexually assaulted, and all the other things that are reality in this. When we think about our history as these singular events without putting ourselves in the positions that we can possibly understand, we're cutting ourselves short. We're, we're human beings. We're having a spiritual existence and a human participation. And I just think that we've been taught so well that we don't trust ourselves and mm. you know mm. Mrs. Parks represents so much of that and I like that Brian brought up you know her genetics because that's one thing that it, it is being kind of whispered about in the exhibit but many exhibits and many like places that teach history don't like to touch things that involve understanding slavery or understanding indigenous people being enslaved. I'm gonna hold hold that thought. Donnie and I had a conversation in the car that kind of that kind of touches on this. It does. Because I did I didn't realize until this morning that there was actually a small white supremacist march in DC, from the Lincoln Memorial to Congress and then to a Walmart car park. But you have you know white supremacists saying you know we have to reclaim our country. Which ties into what you're saying, because if we're really honest about the, his the complex, multi-layered history of this country, you can't separate African from European from Native American. Not after a certain point. Not after it's, it's, <laughs> it is all intertwined, and it's been intertwined for centuries. Um, so that, I just wanted to catch you there before you went on to your, to your next thought. Uh, it's very exciting to even be in that position of thought to think that the Atlantic coast of the Americas could have been even inhabited by Africans dealing with trade and diplomatic missions well before any European. And then as you do your genetic testing, you see this strong African DNA and you think that it comes from somewhere other than America. How else would you explain the Olmec kids and how the pyramids are the same in both of these grand continents, but to try to make your mind 
imagine thousands of years ago, possibly 10,000 years ago, where the great geneticist of the planet lived in the Americas. They created t hundreds of types of corn and potatoes that can grow at different elevations. Mm -hmm. They moved the plants and our, and our animals and, and the things that were important for genetics on the planet, who knows to what extent. And it has to be forgotten if we all agree to go to universities that start at Aristotle and Plato. And it's not a criticism of academia to say that we understand it to be a challenge to think in these terms. But the fact that they exist means that any reality has to consider them. And this isn't a conversation about you weren't born during slavery and you're not responsible for it. This is a conversation about these conditions that led to advanced science were contributed to by our great ancestors. And as we reach into the genetic explanations of these things, you cannot just dispel them. It's real. Y'all wasn't ready for this conversation <laughs> way the other day, Lord. I'm, oh my good. Okay, so Lewis, oh, <laughs> y'all wasn't ready. I'm, I'm, I am, I am. Okay. Well, so. just <laughs> I'm gonna say, buckle up, Buttercups, because here comes part two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The other conversation that Johnny and I were having on the way to the studio was ever since the American History Museum, um, the Ameri Afro American History Museum has been built, and they have a staggering archive. I guess subconsciously I thought, oh, okay, well, now most of that history is now in that museum. Then I get an email from you going, oh, we have a research project. Uh, the Library of Congress has a research project I think you'll be really interested in. Would you like to come in, take a look at some old photographs? And then I'm flipping through this book of eight, you know, 19th century people, black people, who did most, you know, a lot of them here in the DC area, who did amazing things, amazing things. And it made me realize there's an even more enormous archive of African American history at the Library of Congress. You know, and we just literally just going through a binder of what they have in the, in the vaults. That was just. That wasn't even the tip of the iceberg. That was just the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, in terms of African American history, I mean, how much material does the Library of Congress actually have? Well, things like manuscripts incredible. and images and things. <clears throat> uh, it's incredible. I mean, um, in general, the Library of Congress collections have been building since 1800. Um, it is the home of copyright, so a lot of the content came in the form of copyright requiring uh, two copies of your produced materials, um, and one would exist at the Library of Congress. As far as African American music materials, it's really absolutely phenomenal to know that the great papers of Frederick Douglass and Thurgood Marshall are there, along with the NAACP collection, which many people don't know, is the most utilized collection at the Library of Congress. The African American prints and photographs are incredible. And what Brian started to tell us about is a project that Brian's actually working on at the library, whereby George W. Woodson uh, was in, within an album of photographs, uh, African American photographs, those photographs of activists in this country that were teachers and politicians. And uh, interestingly enough, um, Brian is also a relative of the Honorable Mr. Woodson. And um, seeing that photograph has moved him into some research um, we're still looking through some of the Civil War photographs. Um, it's possible that we'll see George Washington Josie, um, the black teenager that at age 19 went to back to Northampton County, North Carolina, put his hand on his mother's shoulder, her name was Venus, and said, you're free. So that's what black teenagers can do, and we can inspire ourselves to respect those black teenagers enough to know that if you don't understand the fashion or the music, 
you have to understand the value. So every black teenager that you see and you walk by as you're doing your research on genealogy, you gotta realize that's a billion. That's more than a billion. And the potential of the intellect means that the value is gone beyond money. So I think that what you can discover at the library is some of the primary source materials that could possibly lead you to identifying more of what you're seeing in your now and give you uh, sort of the political awareness that the library was built for. Uh, Thomas Jefferson built it because, you know, uh, uh, an educated populace was the better democracy. Um, a Congress that knew of all this various subject matter was better to create the law. And, and we are the people of this nation in a way that I want people to realize that that's the collections of the American people and that G.W. Josie and all the other ancestors that fought in every war in this country, from the Civil War to the ones that we're having right now that you don't even know where they are, represent us and represent our citizenship so that whether or not there's a question of what is owed to us, we know that whatever it is, is something that involves making real and whole that body of people that built this country. So the Library of Congress is the collections of the American people, and we are the American people. I was gonna say even before that, going all the way back to the um Colonial wars with the Native Americans and the right. French, Native Americans American and the, and the French. The American Revolutionary War, the the Mexican War, the, the War with the uh, French, War of eighteen twelve, all of them. I mean, we've been in every last one of the, those those different wars. I work at the Daughters of the American Revolution, and there are definite, definitely um, African American women who are finding their patriots and who are, are part of the, you know, working very hard. As a matter of fact, the DAR works very hard to prove African-American women, to bring on African-American women and their patriots, because that's something that they, they, they're striving for that. Katrina Rose made a really, good a really good comment. We don't trust each other. Having those leaders cut down has uh, impeded the rise of those, those type of leaders, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And we need to do with black leaders, both current and, and previous, what other people do with their leaders. Um, and that kind of goes into what you were saying. We can either believe the history as it's taught to us in school, and it's always, that's always taught through a lens that is not a black lens. It's always told to us. You don't want me to get into that. Or, <laughs> or go to your local, you know, your history archives, go to your local university archives, search online. The records are out there. They really and are. And the records will always tell you the truth. They really are. And, and that's what this show is about. It's about reminding people that these things that we're, we're not bringing up, we're not teaching revisionist history. We're reminding you that you're actually being taught revisionist history mm -hmm. in school. We're reminding you that there's so much more out there for you to know, for you to learn, for you to understand that you're only getting part of your history, that there's so much more for you to know, yeah. that they're only yeah. giving you what you what they want you to know um i would say you know on keeping in keeping to katrina's point people people are quick to say well martin luther king was an adulterer well so's the president oh, right without, there at 16, a doubt, let's without just, 1600 avenue let's keep it real mm -hmm. <laughs> if we want to keep it real so is the president you know we're not saying that to be a leader you have to be perfect or infallible but you know, Martin Luther King was a selfless person who, you know, did what he did, as did all of the, as did all of the great kind of leaders. No one is perfect. No. Everyone makes mistakes, but they're fighting for something that's bigger than they are, or yeah. they were. So I'll, I'll have another. I have another thing because I want to. I want to kind of go back a little bit to the Rosa Parks thing. So when Rosa Parks did what she did, what year was that? It was 1955 right. when she refused to give up her seat, and that was December the 1st right. when she was arrested. Right. But she did what she did from 1943 on. Okay, so <clears throat> the 55, that's, that's what I wanted to, 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 
touch on. Because when she did what she did in 55, a couple of months beforehand, there was a little girl that did it. Claudette Colvin. Right. Hmm. So does, is that brought up in the Rosa Parks um, thing about her? Is that brought up in, in your... Uh, because they said that Claudette was not focused on because she was pregnant. Okay. Right. Um, yes. And okay. you can get that part of the story. Uh, all That's of that right. is fused together. When you look closely, Claudette Colvin was the first that um, Fred Gray was going to bring through the court system. Fred Gray was the lawyer that tried the case that Mrs. Parks was arrested for, mm -hmm. but she didn't attach her name to that legal case. Okay. Um, Browder was the name, I believe, that's attached to that case. So now we're talking about three different women and a strategy that was necessary at a time where we were poorly represented in the judicial system. I think that we could expect some injustice when we appeared in these courts. And it took a lot of thought. It took a strategy where you know, people point to Mrs. Parks being more mature, maybe more established in a family. Claudette Colvin was a younger woman. But at the same time, I feel that Mrs. Parks represented more of a media moment mm -hmm. for the Montgomery Improvement Association and the bus boycott. And Claudette Colvin represented a stark reality, which in my opinion, we need to search out within the civil rights movement because that's where the protection of our women and the fact that our young woman is not supposed to be manhandled on any public transportation. She's not supposed to be, not supposed to be sexually assaulted in any way. They're not supposed to be called out of their names. So these things are for the Metro bus riders and everybody that's going on right now too. Mm -hmm. You know, look look at the situation so you can be mature enough to understand what these elements are. It's not one or the other. They didn't select Mrs. Parks because she was light-skinned. All of the little stupid stuff that goes on. Put it together so when you ride the bus home, when you ride the Metro home, you don't talk to my young daughters on the bus. You don't talk to them on the train. If you think that they're using vulgarity, stay out of their business. I'm looking after them. Their parents are looking after them. This is something that we need to understand from the Claudette Colvin point of view of why this thing is sensitive. So that now in the modern age, we don't villainize ourselves when we're in the middle of a movement that nobody seems to understand we're in the middle of. Right. This is an unfinished revolution that we're talking about. Just to cut to the chase, because I don't think that we're going to be speaking for five hours here. <laughs> We're, we're talking about things that our black women are still suffering through, strong people. We're talking about genealogy so that we understand that we're the landowners, that we're talking to people that, yeah, we, we got respect for the government and America and all those things so we can walk back and forth to our jobs, but it needs to be settled in a way that we could at least understand the truth of our history. Connection with the ancestors is everything for spirituality. If you're here to be here, fine, but your spirit might have things to do forever. And I'm here in my physical self telling these truths at the opportunities that I have and not really having fear of favor and with no apology. I'm, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that if we could get our heads around what this really is, then we can live in the now. That's how important it is. People say, well, that's old. Little kids are like, I can't really identify with Rosa Parks or the Civil Rights Movement because it's not clicking into some of the lanes that they think should and, be and clicking. That, and that's why I wanted to add Claudette in because you made the statement about how they used, how everything was kind of calculated with Rosa Parks, how they were went into a type of training on how to deal with everything. If that is the case, then these are things that we need to be doing now, being able to train our people on how to, and when I mean by our people, I'm not talking about black people or, or I'm talking about everybody who wants to protest. They literally have to go through a type of training program all over again on how to go about doing this because that's what they had to do back then. It's like starting over again. 
Stop telling me that history don't repeat itself because it does. It's over and over again. Don't tell me that we are not going to constantly repeat these things if we have to go through this stuff over again. But it's like what I explained to my 22 year old nephew. Because again, he's part of that generation that's like, well, that was way back. That was way back then. My son that is, is too. That doesn't have anything to do with today. And I'm like, look, I'm going to break it down for you in the most simplest way possible. It's like, I'm not saying this apply to Rosa, but a lot of those women on that bus were coming and going back and forth to work. They were working, you know, they were maids. They were domestic people who were working in the white side of town, having to take a bus that could have been a half hour journey, 45 minute journey, hour journey, who knows? But they're literally taking a bus across town. You have been on your feet all day, looking after other people's kids, cleaning their house, scrubbing their toilets, cooking their food. You get a bus back home. Like I said, think, you've literally spent all day on your feet. You're sitting down on a bus, and because you're black, you're told to get up? I'm with her, I would have been hell no. It's, it's worse than that. I mean, but he got it. When I explained it to him that way, it's like, imagine you, you know, going to um, the I, you working at the I, iPhone store, you do a nine hour shift, you want to, you know, you're just sitting, sitting on a bus or a train, minding your own business, and someone tells you to get up. Mm -hmm. How are you going to feel? Mm -hmm. Then he got it. Yeah. Well, well, that's part of how white supremacy works. The transportation system is essential to white supremacy. It limits movements. If they can control populations that aren't able to move around, um, then it's better for them. Harriet Tubman was thrown off a bus. Frederick Douglass was thrown off right, the were. train. Um, Dr. Mays was thrown off the train. All these people had this common experience. That's why what happened to even the three that we've mentioned, Browder, um, Colvin, and, and Parks, isn't the, what happened. I mean, these things happen 100 times a year. Yeah. And people sat next to these people having this experience and seeing this over and over again. So I have a lady who was thrown. I found a, a story of a lady who was thrown off the bus in 1895, but she won her case. And it wasn't a bus at then. It was in New York. Um, I'm trying to find it real quick for you guys now, but it was actually a. Um, what is it called? Is that one of those trolleys? It's a trolley. trolley. It was a trolley, yeah. and she actually won her case. But she um, she was thrown off, right? And she won her case, but she was thrown off. Going to work, same exact situation. Going to work, and um, they told her she needed to get off. And she looked at them like she was crazy, like they, you know, she's like, I'm not getting off. And but this one, she won her case in New York, 1895. So I mean, I, I know historians say. The history doesn't repeat itself, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It does. It does. Over and over again. Well, it does. I'm, I'm glad you said that story because it gives us an idea of what transportation and moving around this country That's was right. at the time of Jim Crow, mm -hmm. at the time that there were certain free blacks in this country <laughs> that still needed to move. Um, but Professor... Uh, um, is it McDaniels? Oh my gosh, there's a book called At the End of the Dark Road. Uh, Daniel McGuire, Professor Daniel McGuire, I believe. Um, and she writes in these accounts of how the bus was used to rape women, not just throw them off the bus, but to drive them at the end of the road mm. because they're riding the bus and the last bus is what they gotta get on and somehow some of these diabolical plans get cooked up and women are on the bus. So she documents that in her book, talking about what the conditions were for black women in this country. And you could imagine. I mean, you look at the news right now, you see all the, the sexual villains everywhere. You know what alcohol is doing to these people, young and old. And you know that there is a fourth and six level citizen that's walking from church to our house those boys on the back of that truck are you kidding me the viciousness that the possibilities are now is multiplied when there's no law and no court that's going to defend those women 
This is what you can find out when you go see the Rosa Parks collection. This is what you can find out about what should motivate you as a political person now. And I agree, this isn't a black or white issue. This is just what's right and how we need to make our situation correct to move forward in a, in a, in a, in a type of democracy we could all be proud of and be in that same sort of way that truth is part of our history, not a cover-up so that people don't have to know what others have gone through even to achieve what we've achieved. To be here with you all and to know the extent of your knowledge and what you've done with your lives, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a hell of an achievement for the seamstress known as Rosa Parks that, you know, basically was married to the barber and changed the whole country and made it a democracy that was tolerable enough so that everybody wouldn't just throw up in a cup. 2020, black people have to do what? They drink out of what water fountain? Like, how does that float internationally if you're, you're on the rhetoric of being this great democratic experiment or this wonder of civilization? I mean, come on. I mean, it's just a matter of time before somebody like me would be able to say that with the last five minutes of their life before somebody came with a musket and blew me away. But now it's 2020. I said all that and I'm still sitting here at least for another second. And if there was even one little cub in the woods that heard what I was talking about, it's gonna keep going. I have faith in that God. So well, I was gonna say the, the other thing that I really enjoyed about the exhibition is you really kind of get a sense of Rosa's personality. She was really she was a really thrifty woman. The fact that she's right she's actually writing stuff on the back of utility bills, mm -hmm. you know. And those original no, sorry, it was a photocopy. It wasn't the, the it was a photocopy of the original, mm -hmm. kind of blown up, huge. Mm -hmm. Literally, her handwriting. You know, it's her wow. handwriting on the on the back of back of the bill. She yeah. let she let nothing go to waste. Wow. So you you mentioned something about today. You guys know that there actually is. Um, a news is there's some news going on now about metro bus drivers sexually assaulting women. Really? Right now. Wow. Right now. So when he said that, so it's it's still it's still happening. It's still happening. Just like he not said only that, that, but police officers yes. and other people that are within our trust. It's literally going on like an epidemic right in front of your right face front, right now. Right in front of but your because face. you yeah. don't make the right connection to what you already know about the civil rights movement. That's right. You have no idea how to identify the thing that's gonna go on for the next 50 years as well that goes on in front of your face and we can't protect our women or our children. So now your discussion about your humanity is in question. Are you a man? Are you a human? This is my focus. I'm a family person. I'm here to protect my children. I put my life down for my family, my wife. Matter of fact, all the things that I'm telling you right now is because I feel the strength from their love to do it. And that's really what my existence is about. I, I mean, I, I'm so sorry to hear that about the Metro driver. Yeah. You know, it's, I'm, it's, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. But um, the awful thing is, it's just, pe it's just people. And again, it's not a black or white issue. It's people going about their everyday life. You're going to work, you're coming, you know, you're coming home from work. So you're probably coming back from work thinking about what you're gonna be cooking from dinner. You don't wanna be thinking about, oh, am I gonna actually make a home intact, yeah. safe, uh, you know, unimpeded. I like what you're saying, because now we can see what it is. It's a worker's movement. And those domestics represented a major part of how they black did. families were supported. Right. So the fact that that was being attacked was enough for us to have a strong response to it. This is not something about the bus and people's feet or a single event. This is something that is a revolution in this country that identified the rights of workers and connected that with the rights of women and children so that it was the global human rights movement. And that is why Though that collection, I think, is so heavily studied at the Library of Congress and people internationally from the Arab mm -hmm. Spring on to thinking about what they would do in Iran are starting to consider what's successful and putting your head up against bullets and batons, your leaders can't last. But, you know, as you're saying that, and again, you know, the organization of unions in this country have, has always had a troubled history, but black people in particular, and I'm thinking about sharecroppers, in particular, in the South, who tried to organize for better pay, 
better working conditions, better, you know, so their children could go to school and not have to, to work in the field like, like, the, like the old days. And the fact that they were murdered, lynched, tortured, run out of the county, run out of the state, if they were lucky, if they were allowed to keep their life, well, you got 24 hours to pack up your stuff and your family and get out of Dodge. Right. Lisa Wade said, why is an African-American history being taken out of the daycares and public schools? In my opinion, the last time African, close to teaching black history was done was when I was born. I think now it's so diluted that it's ridiculous. Um, I think I got a, a good share of it as I was growing up. Um, but my children, they only have it because of me. And my children are 27, well, soon to be 27, 24, 21, and, and, 18, and 19. So I, that, that's, an, that's an awesome question that we need to ask. And, and find out because if this kind of information is available at the Library of Congress for what he said it's for, for Congress, for us to, to know these things, then why is it not available to, to us in that manner? Some of this stuff is good. I, I think it's good that we have to take a new look at what history, African history, American history, just the timeline of history is. Because just like Rosa Parks shows us, there's so much more to it than what we've been taught. And maybe the things we've been taught are keeping us from being effective in our movements. So the fact that this exists... <coughs> Sorry. Well, I was going to say, <coughs> part of what I found really invaluable about the day that I spent with you and your colleague was... Um, George Henry Woodson had been in my tree for years. <coughs> I wish we had some water. Yeah. <clears throat> he had been in my tree for years, and I knew a little bit about his, his story, and I would researched his family. And again, in one of the conversations that I had with you was um, <coughs> he, boycott, he tried to get the state of Iowa to boycott the movie Birth of a Nation. Mm -hmm. I never knew that anyone tried to get that movie boycotted. Ever. So, you know, that, that was a really powerful moment to me going, one person, I mean, ultimately he wasn't successful because you can go through the Iowa newspapers and see where they actually screamed. But um, one, you know, one man took it upon himself to, um, like I said, try to, get, try to get that particular movie banned. Yeah, so, that, that's, that, and that's awesome. I'm sorry I don't have any water for you, Lewis. Okay. We'll get okay. it. Bring more. <coughs> um, but uh, and there's just so many stories that are that are like that. But I think so many times we just, as we discussed in the show, if American history was taught properly, it would cover everything. There's you know there's more than enough room in the curriculum. I mean, you have 12 years to educate young minds. 12. 12. You know, and to keep getting the same people over and over and over again, and the same history taught over, you know, repetitively every year, that's part of the reason why the focus is so narrow. Like I said, I have people who didn't, you know, I get into arguments with people on Twitter who don't realize that there were Chinese people in New York who fought in the American Revolution. They were there. That Muslims fought in the American Revolution. Right. They were there. That Jews fought in the American Revolution. Right. They were there. Right. And then Katina Rose says she can't even convince her, her son to vote. And she says she doesn't know how to reach him. And I'm going to tell you something. I am waiting for the day that my son and Brian can sit down and talk. Not, because I, I, my son, I think, he, I think he has finally started voting. But I think my son is definitely one who would have benefited from going to college, because he did not go to college. Um, but he's like one of these really, really intelligent people. But when, you know, one thing about going to college is that you're around, you, you're exposed to all different types of groups and you get to see all different types of groups of people. So you get to see all of this stuff. Now, I tried to expose my children to all of that. But my son ended up, getting 
in a position when he left, when he when he graduated from high school, he moved in with his dad. And he got to quote unquote do what he wanted to do. I'm I was the disciplinary person in his in his life. Not his dad. And um so he ended up hanging with one group of people at one point. And this one group of people I think kind of influenced him to be a certain way. So now he looks at things in a manner that I just can't stand. And that's fine that you do that, but you need to see other sides. I was always the one to make him see other, be like, well, look at this too, and look at that. So I try to tell him now, I'm like, researching with me would be so beneficial to you. So. To you, Katina, Katrina, see if your son will start researching with you because I am one to definitely say that researching has allowed me to see certain sides that I haven't seen before that allows me to, to know more, to learn more, and maybe it'll open up some things for your son that he didn't get a chance to see because I still talk <coughs> to my son. My son calls me, we talk, and, and we have nice really bad arguments to the point where I call Brian and like I want to choke him or want to you know or yeah I was a bad mother the other day because <laughs> I said this to him and you know but but we we still have we have those types of conversations so I, I definitely suggest you try to maybe that's a way to, to try to reach him and, and see if he'll do that because we have to reach our boys we have to reach our babies some kind of way to get them involved. My daughter doesn't even talk to her brother when it comes to politics. She can't. She 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 can't. Cause she's she's the woke one, and he's the one that thinks he's woke. So, <laughs> and she hates the word woke. So that that's how that is. And you know. Well, I guess my viewpoint is I understand where the younger generation wants to go. They think that they think we're there. We're not. But I can appreciate and I can see where they want us to be. And it's just trying to educate them to understand where we've come from, where we are now, and start building the steps to get to where they want to go. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, the steps to where we want to go are built with their opinion included. And that's something different than us teaching from our point of view. So that involves a listening and <clears throat> I think that even if young people don't want to vote, it's possible for that to enter the dialogue about what the agenda would be if they did vote. Mm -hmm. And part of what's happening now is that people are realizing that they have to have some principles behind voting and a reason to really vote for a person beyond just this is what I heard everyone was doing. So young people are actually in a healthy dialogue with that, whereby people that have voted for the last 40 years have done it like cattle going through different gates. And that dialogue with somebody who's like, yeah, I might not be as woke as somebody else, but I'm, I'm thinking about these things and that's not being addressed has to be included. Because hmm. quite frankly, we're going to find that the majority of voters are going to be under 28 years old very quickly and that they may be savvy enough to create platforms and agendas that we may have to be a part of more than directing. So exactly. allow them to be a part of your conversation. Allow people to realize that it's not convincing someone to vote your way that matters in that discussion. Right. And if you talk to children, especially your own, or people in your community that's younger than you, you have to be prepared to be the teacher and the student. Yep. You have to learn from them because that's going to help you with your next lesson and <clears throat> some of the ways that we've learned from other teachers has to evolve now with us. Yep. But yeah, I'll give you an example. Some of the things I hear from younger family members is, well, my white friends don't see color. I'm like, that's not the that's right what, answer. Yeah. It's like the answer is they should see my color and your color and it shouldn't matter and it shouldn't matter that's there should right be no and and that's exactly what my son will say but then the thing about my son is that it's it's not that's not the issue like to was it today no yesterday 
he and I had a conversation about gender. And and we were we were he it's like he's confused because he has my teaching and then he has what he's learning from this one group. So he has this big confusion that goes on within him. You have you, you have male and you have female, but this cisgender thing, it makes you say that if you call me a female, I should feel um, offended by it because you called me a female. <laughs> so he was having a, a discussion about that, and he was and he's like, my mother shouldn't be offended because I called her a female. I shouldn't think of she shouldn't think of. Me, because I called her a female, she shouldn't think that I'm calling her an animal because that's what they say now. If, if I'm called a female, then I don't know that you're calling me a human. I think you're calling me an animal. So we went through all of this, and that part is mommy's teaching. She's a human being. Why would in the world would she think that I'm calling her an animal? That's mommy's teaching. So he's going through all this stuff. But then the other side is the other teaching where he's like, and that's the polit political side. Oh, you guys are just going through all it. It's just crazy. Yeah. So he's so mixed up and so, I just pray for him. Well, that, again, that's the conversation I had with the publisher about one of my books. Your book? Because oh I God. used the word mother and father. Oh my God. And they took exception and they're like, well, you need to use a gender neutral word. I'm like, but we're talking about biology. That's it's like it I, it's like it's different than if you're trying to register a child in a school or with a doctor, and you have either um, a gender fluid person or someone who's trans trans gone from one gender to another mm -hmm. or has no gender at all. Then it's parent one, parent two. Right. I completely get that, and I'm completely on board with it. Yeah. But genealogy is talking about biology. Right. You need a sperm, you need an egg. You need a mother, <coughs> you need a father. If you're looking at all, you need a Y. And if you're looking at all of those <laughs> old records, what do they say? Mom, Mom dad. And it's like, and why would you stop there? What, are you going to get rid of grandmother and grandfather? Well, is right. that, that going to be It next? sounds like what we're talking about is accommodating for a group of people on the planet that are making choices to include the third, possibly the fourth gender. And there's a great consideration of their feelings and a sensitivity to avoid judgment about their psychological position, about their physiological born with body. Okay, but and and, and uh, but well, let me land. <laughs> and with that as being a solid planetary consideration, all I'm wondering is if we can begin to think about the injury that's happened to black people oh, in this okay. country. Okay, okay. Can we begin <laughs> to think about G.W. Josie putting his hand on Venus and saying, now you're free. Mm -hmm. And to have all those generations after him come and fight it out on their own. That's and right. now it's time for us to educate our children and create our international corporations. Yeah. Yeah. All of that sensitivity about the third bathroom and the fourth gender, I totally understand. Yeah. Listen to this. Rewind it and play it again. Yeah. I'm not against you. That's right. I understand that there's a lot that goes into the psychology of your identification. That's right. And I'm telling you that historically there has to be a consideration for a reality that I'm willing to talk about today and every day. If you're in the distance where you can hear my voice, there's no reason for us not to talk about the truth of American slavery and how we fought ourselves out into freedom and how we had to survive through having these families and wondering if whether or not we should get equal justice and fairness and be able to go to universities and learn truth and not have to worry about all these things that are addition to our captivity and the prices we've already paid. That's all. Just a little, you know, I understand mm -hmm. you. You understand me. And mm -hmm. The world is changing, and that's why it's not the same as it was with Rosa Parks. It's not the same. It's different. And now we can talk about it. So if your 19 to 28-year-old tells you they do not want to vote, ask them, do they have something they want to discuss about the political agenda? And you might learn something from them. 
And you might even find somebody who heard that and now they're the person you can vote for. Because these, these politicians are going to morph into the thing that the power makes them morph into. That's but right. until we realize we are the power, then we're going to believe we're not the power. Trick, trick, trick. Sounds like my reply to my, my publisher <laughs> going, um, the world of genealogy just ain't ready for that it's yet. It's not ready for it. That's right. We, literally, the geneal genealogical field has not had oh, that conversation oh about gosh. how we're going to how we're going to sensitively and accurately address this very thing <coughs> for future genera generations of genealogists. You just hit the nail on the head and with the biggest hammer mm. in the world. because. Yeah, because that's exactly what I was, that's, that's what I was going to say. And maybe not as nicely as well put that you did it, but. And it is such a shame that we have rapidly run out of time because I really wanted to ask you about living in Africa. You were the first person in my family that I know of yeah. that lived in Africa. We're going to have to get you back on the show just to talk about what it was like to live in. How long did you live there, by the way? Eight years. And I lived in, in Ghana. I lectured at the University of Cape Coast. I worked on a program called Minorities for International Research Training. Students from Howard, big up to Howard University, came there, All right. spent you know years with me dealing with um, herbal research for diabetes. We worked in laboratories. We did thin layer chromatography, isolating compounds from herbs, cool. and um, you know figuring out that aspect of things. Yeah, we will definitely have to get yes, you back. Yes, we will on. definitely have to get you back on this show. Okay. So, Lewis, this was an awesome show. Thank you so much for putting down that knowledge, that nugget, that that you 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 <laughs> man, you hit it. You did. I I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to go like this. I'm I'm ready. I, I love it. I love it. So yes. Um. So I want to apologize right now, <laughs> just real quick, for because Lewis was a backup for the last show that we were supposed to have. <laughs> And I'm so glad that he was able to step in when he was able to step in. And, um, but he, he had a, a family emergency. Mr. Mack had a family emergency. So he will be on our show, but he'll be the last one for family his, for Black History Month. So next week's show. Next week, we have the very talented, very awesome Rick Murphy joining us to drop his nuggets about Black history. Yeah. Talking a little bit about the, the first Africans at Virginia and a whole lot more. Yes, he's going to talk about Augs. He's going to talk. Uh, uh, yes, he is. Yes, so yes, our Augs members, I need you to get on the show, <laughs> watch it, ask your questions. Definitely do that. I'm an Augs member of DC. All right, so I want you guys to definitely join us. And um, we're gonna we're gonna ready to start getting. And after Black History Month, we're gonna start getting ready for Women's History Month. So we're gonna be focusing on our African American women. Tired of sitting around talking about the same women, y'all. We are definitely <coughs> gonna try to go and look at some new people. It's time for us to start focusing on all of us, not just the same people all the time. So I'm Donya. I'm Brian. We will see you next Sunday at 4 o'clock and enjoy the rest of your day. Yes, you guys have a great day. Thank you again for joining us. That's so fun. Thank this you. Thanks awesome. for inviting me.